Shalom, and welcome to Hanging on His Words. My name is Ken Heidebrecht. I want to welcome you here. Thank you for taking the time out of your precious lives to come and hang out with me and my incredible guest. We have some very intriguing content to present tonight, and by we, I mean mostly my guest. He's put together a rather um, comprehensive slideshow presentation for you guys today, so he put a lot of effort into it, guys, and... I'm excited to uh, have him on just because we need individuals like this brother, Mr. George Newber from the YouTube channel GeoTruth in our community, on our side, you know, many of us, as I would assume, are biblical creationists. And so what that means is we believe what the Bible says about the, uh, the world that our father had created. And we do not agree with the current modern view uh, and assertion of what it is that we live on and where we reside within God's creation. So we need individuals like him <clears throat> in our corner, you know, champions that can go and, and help us with the science because guys, I'm, I'm going to admit I'm not amazing when it comes to math and um, other areas that have to do with numbers and stuff like that. So it's just awesome when a brother like George can can come on and say, "Hey, I'm good at that stuff. Uh, I can I can help with that, and I can show you how to um, prove a lot of interesting things that uh, just so happen to line up with what the Word says about the luminaries above us, about the world that God created." And so I'm really excited to have him on. I hope you guys enjoy his presentation. It's it's quite a long one, so I really encourage you to. You know, get comfortable in your chairs wherever you're at. Hopefully, you're watching on a decent screen. Um, you know, if you're watching on your phone, that's fine. It's just we're, we're going to have a lot of like little video snippets that he has uh, pre made for this presentation. And so it would probably go better if you're watching it on a larger screen, like a laptop or a, a TV. But either way, I'm sure you'll get um, the gist of what he is trying to say. And so before we bring him on and introduce him to you guys, I just want to say hi to folks in the uh, the virtual ecclesia aka the chat and so we have mr james losey shalom brother thanks so much for coming bob cleveland i think we're an hour early brother glenna said hi okay hey hi hi glenna back no problem i'm glad to see you guys here kermode bear breaking chains says shabbat shalom welcome thank you for coming elohim's medicine shabbat shalom from appleton wisconsin Shalom. Thank you so much for joining us. I just love how this scattered body is just all over the place. And, um, and we got little pockets here up in the northern tundra of, uh, of Canada. But a lot of you guys reside in the south and, and all over the states. And so it's really cool to see that you're uh, willing to join a Canadian brother for a live stream. So I do appreciate you coming out. Tyler Porter says, Seven Dome Shalom Brave Believers. Shalom, brother. Thank you so much for coming. We got Matt, Country Dad. Thank you so much, brother, for coming. All right, we got the GR Cleave. So we had Bob earlier, solo. Now we got GR Cleave. That's both of them together. So maybe they're together now. Hopefully they are. Mr. Joe Large. Good evening, brother Ken. Hello, Joe. Appreciate you for joining us tonight. If you're with your lovely wife, say hi to her for me. You guys are a blessing to me. Natalia Fors, Shabbat Shalom all. Shabbat Shalom. Mrs. Mary Slattery says, hey, at Country Dad Shalom. She's saying hi to Matt. Everyone's just friendly in the chat. I haven't had any issues with chat members since I've started live streaming, which is amazing. You know, I don't want people fighting with each other, um, throwing virtual blows and all that. So it's nice when people can get along and act maturely. I love it. Back to the covenant says Shalom family. Oh, this is Matt Beavers. Okay. How's it going, Matt? Hope you're doing well. I like the new branding. Back to when I saw that logo, my instant reaction was, huh? Back to the future. This is, oh, back to the covenant. So this is good. I'm sure that's kind of what you wanted. And you want people to see that. And it's got that attractive, like, draw to a familiar uh, film series that a lot of us grew up with. So very cool, brother. Thanks for joining us. Tracy Jones says, blessings to you. As kingdom family. Yes, we are kingdom family. We're future immortals and we're all longing for God's kingdom to come. It's the good news message of the gospel that Yeshua and all the prophets and apostles taught. And it's amazing. And guys, today, 
So it was a rougher day for me. I had to think on that kingdom often throughout my day. It was just one of those, I'm sure you can empathize as um, flawed, frail mortals. Just, you know, doing the rat race and, and doing the nine to five. And sometimes, you know, work can be hard. And so it's good to just stop and pause and be like, oh, yeah, we're going to get some respite one day in the kingdom. And just everything that's going on, the chaos and the craziness that's going on in this world is, is going to come to an end. There is an expiry date. And so that helps me get through my day. It does. Let's uh, see who else is here real quick before we get going. Eternal Light says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Eternal Light. Uh, any more new faces here? We have the glory of Yah's creation. Wendy. Shalom, everyone. Hello, Wendy. Thanks for joining us. Miss Tracy Jones. Hey, sister. Thanks for joining us. Let's see a couple more people, and then we will get our guest on, because again, guys, this is going to be a longer one, and it's it's got to be a long one, because there's, there's so much. I'm going to have this brother on again, just so you know. There's going to be a part two, probably part three. Who knows? A lot of interesting things that uh, that he's been studying and researching. And uh, I want to take the opportunity and advantage of having him on and, and using my channel to do so. So Lou Ribank says, Shalom and almost Shabbat here in Northern California. Right on. Yes, I am so happy that we are upon the Shabbat. It's going to be a great rest for me personally. Ancient hope, shalom at country dad, the glory of the house. Okay. All right. Okay, guys. Sorry if I missed some of you in the chat here. Again, I, I don't like rushing these things because I know it's important to say hi to you folks. You know, I, I love you and I do. Su I'm super thankful so, for all your support um, throughout the years. And um, I just, yeah, I hope that this stuff is a blessing for you. I hope it, you know, it helps kind of reset where you're at in life and just provides you with, again, a glimpse of hope for, for what's to come and is encouraging and edifying to you. So I do appreciate you guys for coming on and um, let's see here. Without further ado, I'm going to, I'm going to invite our guest onto the stage, Mr. George Newber from the YouTube channel, Geo Truth. How's it going, brother? Good. Shabbat Shalom, Ken. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm, I'm better now. My heart rate has gone down. Like I said, my day was a, a frantic, hectic day. It was a go, 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 go uh, type of day. And so I just feel like I'm, I'm finally able to relax. Yeah. I'm happy that you, brother, are on and um, are able to present tonight. So I, right. I feel like I'm getting a treat just like the, um, um, the audience members to just kind of, you know, see what it is that you want to show us you. and what the Father's been showing you. And so I'm, I'm thankful. And I really appreciate you having me on here. Uh, I mean, I've been watching you for years now, a couple of years since uh, the light has been shined more into the truth of God's word. And so your channel and, uh, you know, Sean Griffin's channel, Kingdom in Context, um, Josh, Ch Josh's channel, uh, Finding Earth Brothers, and then Matt Beavers, Back to the Covenant, all these, all you guys have been great feeding the truth. Appreciate That's it. That's great. I'm, that blesses me to, to hear that for sure. I always, I don't get tired of those types of uh, comments and sure. yeah, yeah. It's, it's really blessing to, to hear that. So, so brother, before we get into the actual meat of this presentation, I want, I want people to know who you are. Okay. okay. You have a YouTube channel and guys, if you wouldn't mind going over to his YouTube channel, geo truth and just hitting that subscribe button, please. He's got several videos uploaded already. Um, He's a brother who has a passion for God's word and right. for spreading the truth, right? And he has right. a technical background. Hopefully, George, you can kind of tell us kind of your credentials, if you would. You know, people tend to care about that stuff, right? And right. Right. Um, if you wouldn't mind just touching on that, and even just kind of your journey up to thus, you know, okay. current day on, on where the father has led you through your life and, okay. and why you're a biblical cosmologist. Yeah, well, I first came to know the Lord uh, back in 1981. I was 27 years old. So probably half the people watching this weren't born yet <laughs> in 81. But that, that started my journey in knowing the Lord. And uh, I really caught on fire uh, and started serving churches, a local church. I uh, got involved with um, designing churches. I actually went to Virginia Tech and got my degree in uh, civil engineering. But 
when I got into the real world to, real world to work, uh, the jobs I had were quite different. And um, I had to learn how to design, do space design, architecture design, which, you know, uh, I learned how to do. And that continued to grow in my, in my regular job. I got my professional engineer's license. So now I'm able to design myself with my own seal of, to and make more money on the side, which was a blessing. But as time went on, when I learned in my regular job, I was able to use serving the Lord because uh, I started designing churches in the area. Uh, I actually designed a church that we, I was at for 30 years where my children grew up and my first wife was there. And I got involved with uh, music ministry there because I'm really into music and uh, actually got to the point where I was leading worship service there uh, for over the years um, and continued to just grow what I thought at the time in the word that was correct. Again, at that time, I still thought, you know, of the heliocentric model, didn't realize that. Right. right. But yeah, here I'm designing homes and I do a lot of work with levels, you know, levels that you use to level something that you're building, you know, and didn't think about it at that time. So as time moves on, um, when we had the scandemic in 2020, the CVIG scandemic, yeah. uh, we decided that we might, might want to look to move south and uh, start to uh, think about retiring. So we had no plans to come down Myrtle Beach is where we thought we want to live because we're close to our family still up in Northern Virginia. And so when we came down, we saw a house that we thought we'd have to do it now because we couldn't wait for it to be, it would be it was a house I would have designed. Uh, so we, we, we pulled the trigger. We said, well, let, we prayed about it. And so, well, let's see what happens. And in four weeks, we were back, we were down in Myrtle Beach, moved in four weeks to get down here. Uh, and so that was in 2020. Uh, I was praying a lot because of what was going on. I'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning, just praying to God, you know, to protect humanity from what's happening. And that prayer, I think, got answered because I was searching for truth. Mm -hmm. um, my wife, Teresa, at one point, she said, look at this. You know, somebody's saying something about um, the earth being flat because it's level. The water, surface of water is level. And it's like that. Boom. It's like, geez, I didn't Thunderbolt. know. Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, and because we're right in the ocean, we're in the ocean a lot. And these, all you see is a level, you know, a level surface. So I started looking into more and more and was looking on more of the secular side, but then was looking for the Christian point of view, which started pointing toward you and, and Sean and all this. And I thought, OK, uh, so I have started. I wanted to do it myself because I got to prove it to myself. OK, how can I do this engineering wise or scientific? So I started buying the Nikon P1000 camera, getting the tools to prove it myself, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what I did. Uh, started doing that in 2022. Was using my camera to focus on the stars, and you can see that they're basically lights, and there's they fluctuate with some kind of vibration going on. And Venus is like that, and Jupiter, you know, all of them. So it's like, and then when I focus on the sun, it's like, oh, that's a light. There's no fireball there. The moon was still kind of a question, you know, uh, but then it started going to uh, on the ocean and, and go really far away with this camera and then take a, a video of the sky wheel. It's like, well, it's kind of far away. Why is it the same height? Why can't I still see it? And it was not shortened a little bit. Right. Uh, and so I figured out, you know what, I need to do something about the truth here because I've, I've got the ability to understand, you know, trigonometry. And, and this is not rocket science it's just something that you know uh, geometry has been around forever that's what the ancients did when they were doing their navigation you know started lear learning about the sextant and the compass and all this stuff learning about how to how do you navigate you know what's the latitude and longitude points and things like that and then you know it was feeling like maybe i need to do a, a channel uh to show this truth more in a scientific way, realm and because my purpose for Geotruth is to approach people that don't know the Lord at all. So they're more into the worldly heliocentric model or people that like I was and most of us were before. We believed in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Uh, but we still thought that the design of the world was heliocentric because we didn't search the truth farther ourselves. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, so then um, what kicked it off was in 2022 in the uh, fall there was a uh, Flatoberfest here in South Carolina. 
So Teresa, my wife, and I went there, and uh, we knew Sean was going to be there, Sean Griffin, to present part of his Babylon yeah. series. Wanted to meet him, and I thought maybe Josh from Founder of Earth Brothers and Matt from Back to the Covenant would be there, and they all three were, which was a blessing. It was great to see Sean do his presentation, got to meet with him, because I was asking him, well, how do you do these things, do your YouTube channel, and what kind of things that you use? you know, to create the videos. So I got that information. So I'm, I'm learning that. Mm -hmm. Talked to Matt and um, Josh quite a bit. And now the, the three of us are really good friends. Matter of fact, Matt came here to our house and we did the presentation on his channel about the sun and the moon. It was great having him here for, for a couple of couple days. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. It's so just so people can know Matt at um, Back to the Covenant hosted you. Um, on his channel at your house. What was right. this about? Maybe six months ago? Was yeah, that? it was like in June. It's actually with Shav Shavuot, June 5th, I think it was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't yeah. know what the, I can't remember what the video was called because I, I did watch that video. Um, he was so I just encourage people to go and check that out. Obviously, go yeah. over to Matt's channel too, give him some love and uh, yeah, watch that. About the Sun and Moon is what it was titled. But uh, so, and at that point, I pretty much had enough information to prove, which is my first video, episode one. Earth geometry. And that's about a 52 minute video, which, you know, really proves to anybody that wants to watch it. They got to watch it all the way through that, you know, when you look at the surface of all water is level, it doesn't bend or curve. And so it goes into that truth into a lot of detail where I show the curvatures at different uh, on the earth, actual size of the earth that they tell us it is, you know. So it's very, that's very scientific. And of course, most of my, my presentations are going to be dry and scientific. It's not going to be entertaining, but it's yeah. just truth. Then I back up toward the end of the videos, all the scriptures that Yahweh has, proving the truth of his scriptures about his creation. Mm. Yeah. So then maybe Perfect. somebody watching it that didn't know anything about this would go, oh, yeah, here it is, you know? Yeah. No, I love it. Thank you for not shelling that for us and um it's it's great i know there's more depth to your your actual testimony and kind of like you right. know, where you're at currently but um right. i appreciate briefly providing that for us and i love it we're kindred spirits in a lot of ways my friend i see in like in the background behind you you got some musical instruments i too yeah. love yeah. music have have loved yeah. music since i was a young boy and yeah so it's great that's great yeah okay brother well I think without further ado, I'll just uh, I'll pull up the slideshow here. And again, okay. like we had discussed um, before hitting the live button there, you just tell me when to switch. Because unfortunately, okay. guys, everything is on my side. Um, it, this isn't like when he was over with uh, Matt at his house. Um, I have to click the button on my side. So, George, just tell me when to switch over and I'll, okay. I'll do that. And um, yeah, thank you so much again okay. for doing this. And I hope it's a sure. blessing to you folks watching. All right, for the first thing I want to do to set the foundation is to go over navigation and two sides of the earth, which is actually my second video that I have on GeoTruth. If you go there, it's about a 32 minute uh, video, but it sets the foundation of how to learn how we can actually determine the elevations of the sun or moon. So I'll go on to the next slide. Geometry, triangulation, navigation, and astro astro astronomy. Uh, geometry is derived from the Greek word geo, which means earth, and metron, which means to measure. Triangulation is used for navigation and astronomy. Triangulation is based on the laws of plane trigonometry, which is a measurement of triangles. All sides of a triangle are straight lines. The three interior angles of a triangle always shows in totals to 180 degrees. This is just basic geometry for triangles. Navigation is derived, derived from the Latin word navis, which means ship, and agre, which means to drive. Navigation is the science of directing a craft by determining its location, direction, destination, and distance traveled. Astrometry is a precision, precise measurement of positions and motions of celestial bodies, which we will get into later on into the presentation. Throughout history, navigators developed tools to develop their location on Earth by observing the positions and motions of the sun, moon, and stars by using triangulation. This is this old school basic science that they would use to know where they're at by looking at mm -hmm. the celestial bodies. All navigation tools require level surfaces and triangulation to determine locations on the Earth and locations of celestial bodies. Go to the next one. So compass, the compass is a, requires a compass needle to be leveled to freely rotate to find the magnetic north. 
So we're going to go ahead and show a, a video here that I did. It talks about the compass. All right. Here I've placed my compass, which has a bubble level on top of a countertop. We can see by the bubble level that the countertop is level because the bubble is centered within the eyeglass circle. Since the compass is level, the compass needle is able to move freely to locate magnetic north. As I rotate the compass clockwise, the magnetic north needle stays pointed to magnetic north because the compass is level. Next, I will place the compass on a beach ball, which represents a spherical Earth, to see how the compass functions to find magnetic north. Here is a beach ball, which represents a spherical Earth. I place the compass on top of the beach ball, which represents the north pole of a spherical Earth. As I keep the compass level by using the bubble level, we observe the magnetic north needle is free to rotate and finds magnetic north. When I place the compass on the side of the beach ball, which would represent the equator on a spherical Earth, the compass is 90 degrees vertical from being level. We observe the bubble is at the top of the eyeglass circle. The magnetic north needle is no longer free to rotate, but rather rotates along with the movement of the compass, resulting in the compass not being able to find magnetic north. When I move the compass back up to the top of the beach ball, I am able to level the compass, and the compass then finds magnetic north. When I place the compass on the bottom of the beach ball, which would represent the South Pole on a spherical Earth, the compass is 180 degrees upside down from being level. We observe the bubble is at the top of the eyeglass circle. The magnetic north needle is no longer free to rotate, but rather rotates along with the movement of the compass, resulting in the compass not being able to find magnetic north. Navigation using a compass proves Earth is a circular level plane. A compass requires the compass needle to be level to freely rotate to locate magnetic north. Anyone using a compass anywhere on Earth to navigate is able to locate magnetic north once the compass is level. However, a spherical Earth is only level at the North Pole. All other locations going south from the North Pole are between 1 degrees to 180 degrees out of level. The equator is 90 degrees out of level or perpendicular to the North Pole. The South Pole is 180 degrees out of level or upside down to the North Pole. Therefore, since anyone using a compass anywhere on Earth to navigate is able to locate magnetic north, the compass proves the Earth is a circular level plane with north located at the center of Earth's circle. They are navigating on a circular level plane and they just don't know it. All right. Well, so George, okay, but I thought we we're on a oblate spheroid. Isn't that what we're on? <laughs> yeah, that's what a lot of people believe. That's what they've just been programmed to believe that. You know, they haven't really searched for truth. Yeah. And you'll hear people say, "Oh, it's gravity." It's like, yeah, right. Gravity can hold up water underneath the Earth. It's just crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. But that's what we used to believe. You know, and then we knew the truth. So. Uh, yeah, that's the same slide. We can sleep, go to the next one. Okay. I was going to mention um, before we got started, I should have. If there's questions, we'll, we might field some questions at the end, depending on what we're doing for time. But uh, if you guys could wait until the end for questions, that would be that would be great if we end up doing them. 
So another great navigational tool is a, tool is a, sextant, a sextant, which I, I bought and I've been using it too here at the ocean. It's a navigational tool that measures elevation or altitude using angular distances. And they use it to determine the altitude in the sky, the sun, moon, or other celestial bodies relative to the level horizon. This information is used to locate the navigator's latitude. The figure there shows how it's being used. Uh, there's two mirrors. One, basically, you, you uh, align that up, the lower mirror, with the uh, level surface, and then the other one reflects in through it. So, and you have some uh, filters there, so they don't hurt. You, it doesn't hurt your eyes on that top mirror. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The marine chronometer is basically used for keeping uh, time by measuring the position of a celestial body with a sextant and by knowing the exact time of the measurement, a navigator can determine a ship's longitude from the published tables. Uh, back in the day when they didn't uh, have the sophisticated uh, uh, chronometers that, that we do now, they had to put gimbals on them. So when the ship would move around, it would, it would ruin their data. So they had to make sure that the, the uh, chronometer was level, but with gimbals. Mm. Yeah. So we're we'll going to the next slide. So I want to talk about latitude and longitude lines on both the Gleason's and the quote globe map. The reason I'm comparing again is because we can see what they did converting the circular level plane to a globe map. So latitude lines are the circle lines that go from center north out to the Antarctica uh, perimeter circle. They're in degrees and there's a total of 360 degrees of latitude. We'll get to that later on. On the Gleason's map, longitude lines are time. You can look, when you look at the Gleason's map, the earth is a clock. So, uh, and it shows that uh, time as you go along, like, like the spokes in a, in a clockwise circle, time. So on the globe map, the latitude lines are exactly similar where they're uh, circular lines going from now the North Pole out down to the South Pole. Okay, the longitude lines are the same as well for time, but now they're vertical and they rotate around with the same clock idea. So okay. go to the next slide. And this is a conversion video too. Is it just I think a lot of people have seen this video, but I just want to show it again. This is the circular level plane yeah. Gleason's map, and you can see the straight longitude lines look like the spokes extending out from center north to Antarctica's south circular ice wall. Again, these longitude lines are timelines. The circular level plane Gleason's map will start to change into a spherical globe map, and you will observe the straight longitude lines begin to curve downward. Throughout the entire time, the circular level plane Gleason's map is converting to a spherical globe map. The length of the longitude lines remain constant. This is important to know as we move forward in this presentation. As the map continues to turn into a spherical globe, the longitude lines continue to curve and converge to one point, which is, quote, South Pole, and Antarctica becomes a continent instead of the south perimeter circular ice wall. In addition, the north center of the circular level plane Earth becomes, quote, North Pole. We know this depiction of a spherical globe Earth is a lie because it is scientifically impossible for the surface of the ocean waters to bend or curve. Yes, that is very true. I, that's it's not wild how they did that. They just kind of stretched right. it out over and yep. inverted it. Yeah. And when they do that, that's why you see Australia look really different. Anything that's probably from, uh, I don't know, uh, 45 degrees latitude, north latitude, north 45 degrees latitude south is very contorted because they had to do that because the uh, latitude and longitude points are the same for both maps. And we'll get into that later on. I just wanted to show this because it's like, you know, the elites, controllers of the world are just kind of laughing. They, they show us <laughs> with the United Nations like, yeah. emblem and map that it's a just it's it's a circular level plane. It's right there in plain sight. That's all I wanted to show with that. So now we're going to get into the uh, latitude coordinates. Um, latitude coordinates are in degrees with plus 90 at north center and minus, minus 90 at south, which total 360 degrees. Latitude coordinates are located on longitude lines. One degree of latitude on a longitude line equals 69 miles. Therefore, all longitude lines are 24,856 miles in length. 
So that number there should ring a bell. I hope it does to a lot of people. Uh, and there underneath is a calculation, 69 miles times 360 degrees equals 24,856 miles. And we look at that chart there, if we start looking at the, the plus north plus 90, which is center north, it's uh, basically start with zero miles. If we go to the right at plus 45 degrees, that's 3,107 miles. We got another 45 degrees to the equator. We're now at 6,214 miles, another 45 degrees. Uh, right is 9,321 miles, and we get to the perimeter ice wall on Antarctica, it's 12,428 miles. Now we go back to center north at plus, at, at plus 90, and we go to the left, same thing. We go to the left at plus 45 latitude, we get 3,107 miles. Go again another 45 degrees latitude to the equator, 3,107 miles, another 45 degrees. 3, 000, we're at uh, 9,321 miles, and then back to the Antarctica ice wall, 12,428. So if you had, I mean, 12,428, if we add those two numbers at the end, we get to the 24,856 miles. This is how we can calculate distances when we get into the navigational data, okay? We'll go to the next chart. I wanted to point this out too, because uh, on the Gleason's map, it actually shows and explains that uh, in the upper map there, I don't know if hopefully people can read this, but there's two rulers on there. The lower ruler is in nautical miles. And it says, uh, uh, corresponding to nautical miles, 60 miles to the degree of latitude. When you look at the upper scale, which is the English miles, and we're using English miles here. Um, if you look up there, when you get to the English miles at 60, those little increments are three miles each. So you go 60, 63, 66, 69. So that's how the conversion is where I show that. There's 60 nautical miles equals 69 English miles. So we get still the 24,856 miles. Now this is a reference. The lower one is for the globe map. And I got this off of uh, space.com or someplace. But if you read that bottom line, even though latitude is always measured and expressed in degrees, it is easily converted into miles. The distance from the equator to either pole is 6,222 statue miles, which is really 90 degrees. You have to multiply that by four to get close to the 24,856 miles. Um, divided by 90 degrees from equator to pole, this equals to about 69 statute miles for each degree of latitude. So both, both maps have the same distance or longitude lines of latitude, okay? You go to the next slide. Okay. So longitude, I just want to talk again about that. Um, longitude lines are time zones totaling 24 hours in one day. Each 15 degree longitude increment going east from Greenwich Meridian is one hour later in time in relationship to Greenwich Meridian. Then each 15 degrees longitude increment going west from the Greenwich Meridian is one hour earlier in time in relationship to Greenwich Meridian. So. Sometimes people get confused about this, you know, and it, it, you got to think about it, uh, especially when we're starting to look at, you know, where locations are for the sun and the moon, because to get them the right distance away, you need to know where they are in time. OK, um, and we'll see that later on in the presentation. So next slide. George, the Greenwich Meridian, is that is that England? Is that somewhere? Yes. In yes. If you would go back to the uh, back a few slides to the. Uh, Keep going back here. Okay, so on the Gleason's map, it's basically the horizontal line on the right side is Greenwich Meridian, where it says zero time on the out outer line. Yep. Greenwich, yeah, that's the uh, that's the heart, that's the longitude line for basically the start of the day. Uh, but when you go twelve hours the other side. That's the international dateline time. So when you go over there, once you get past that, that's the next day. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I'm just showing this again there, you know, the time, longitude coordinates determine time zone. Like if you look at time zone minus five, that's basically Eastern Standard Time and time zone minus eight is Pacific. So we know that uh, Eastern St Standard Time is always uh, three hours later than Pacific Time if you put five, Six, seven, eight, that's three hours difference. Just kind of a simple way to explain that. Next slide. 
And so again, I've got that underlined here. Uh, therefore, all latitude and longitude coordinates for any location on the Earth are the same for both maps. So keep on going to the next slide. Uh, we already talked about this. This is just a reference to talk about people that might want to share that episode one Earth geometry to the friends that don't know the Lord or the believers in Christ that think that you know we live on a heliocentric model. We don't. This really shatters the foundation of the heliocentric model. If they see this and understand what's going on in the video. Uh, they're going to be convinced that uh, they were lied to, you know, and they need to look for truth somewhere else. Hmm. Yeah. Plug it, plug it, brother. I like it. Yeah. yeah. Right. The next slide. So this is getting into detail, more detailed information, because now we can figure out, since we know that the total length of a longitude line is 24,856 miles. So I lay that on the, uh, circular level plane map here, and you can see it, it that's what it does. It, it, and all the longitude lines do that. And that distance on that, total distance on that line is the 24,856 miles. And now we can use other geometrical equations to determine the circumference, which is 78,087 miles. And we can determine, determine the surface area, which is 480 million, 234,000 square miles. So we're going to use that and compare that with the globe here in a little bit. Uh, the next slide. Um, so now we do the same thing: diameter, circumference, and surface area. Now, if you look at this, um, the lower depiction, it's in white. Uh, so if you look at the, you see it says long, longitude circumference of 24,856 miles. So what happened was they took the longitude straight line on the the Gleason circular level plane map and curved it just like we saw in that video. So now, uh, it's, now this is circumference. So if we know what the circumference is, we can do calculation to get the diameter of the of the uh, globe Earth, which is 7,912 miles. So this is how they took the truth of the circular level plane and, and made a lie of it. Mm. There is, um, there is a, a, a hint of brilliance to what they did, though, isn't there? Like, the, the deception oh, is rather, like, it's kind of, it's rather brilliant in a way. This is you the know? only way they could do it, though, Ken. It's got to be, it's, there's scientific reason for it. This is the only way they could do it, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's still, the longitude line with the latitude distances is still 24,856 miles. They just change it a different look, right? Yeah, and sure. and it, it scientifically, they couldn't have picked, done it another way. They knew that the level circular plane is 24,856 miles in diameter, straight line, but they had to figure a way to do it. They used geometry, which is scientific, to convert it this way. Mm -hmm. um, so then we see the surface area, because we uh, this calculation here is of a sphere, <laughs> is 196,662,000 square miles. So now the next slide we're gonna the, the next slide you're gonna see is in scale. Oh, we'll go ahead and do this. It's another longitude line conversion. Okay. Yep. It just shows a line conversion. This is a circular level plane Earth showing longitude lines, which are time zones with 24 hours shown around the perimeter. We will now observe the progression of how the circular level plane Earth level longitude lines of 24,856 miles, which is the diameter of the Earth, is converted into a spherical globe Earth by turning the longitude lines of 24,856 miles into a circle or sphere with a circumference of 24,856 miles. Here we got some, some pretty sweet graphics, guys. This makes it a simpler uh, the longitude way line is now converted to half a circle with the same length of 24,856 miles. The longitude line is now almost a circle or sphere the center north changed to the North Pole and the South Circle changed to the South Pole. Now the 24,856 mile longitude line is a full circle and is a circumference of the globe Earth. So that pretty well explains it right there, you know? Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Um, and here, this is a comparison. I thought this was good to do because when you look at this, the Gleason map and the globe map are to scale relative to each other right here. Can you see that difference? It's yeah. a huge difference. Yep. Um, and so again, my main point here too, I threw the compass in here at the four different locations. And you can see with center north, with it being level, the compass works all the time. Wherever you go, you know, north, south, east, or west, it, you're going to be able to use that compass because it's level. The surface of the earth is level. If you look over here on the globe side, there's just no way. If you're down at the bottom of the, quote, south pole, the compass would be, if it worked, would be looking straight through the, to the ground. <laughs> right. Um, and the key point here is I've got them in the, they're basically highlighted in um, underline. The surface area of the Gleason's map is 2.46 times larger than the globe map. So that's how much smaller it got when they did this. Hmm. And the globe map reduces the Gleason's map surface area by 59%. So, you know, they, they did that pretty much by, um, again, using that geometric equation, taking the straight line and just using it for, for a circle and making it out of sphere. Um, yeah, it, it's wild because it's like when you consider the narrative they push regarding you know the climate crisis that we're in and the overpopulation crisis and the, all the crises that they're, you know, right perpetuating on us. It's like, well, yeah. so you, you make the that. ball that small, you got to make the ball that small and, and promote right. what you're doing. And yeah, it's craziness. Yep. And they have to keep doing that agenda. You know, if, if we're pushing truth out, you know, there's this always battle of truth and lies um they got to keep pushing the lies you know um, yeah. you have to keep their agenda going um so this is another graphic of showing how they reduce the uh area by 59 percent so in the center there you see the globe earth and it's a little hard to read but at the top line there that's the uh 24,856 miles from antarctica to antarctica the, you know from each side of the perimeter Antarctica ice wall. But when you go and do the uh, latitude lines, when you start touching them where they hit the globe model, you can see there's that 59%. All that hash line is where they reduce the surface area of the, the true earth. Just another depiction. Mm. Um, that, uh, it's, yeah, it's amazing how the lie is, the lie is so much, so big. It's huge, yeah. So we're going to start with the next slide. I think we're going to go into the next presentation. Now we're going to get into the sun and moon uh, part for figuring out the elevation. So perfect. Be before good. we before we get there, let me just address Mr. Hutch. Thank you so much for the super sticker. I appreciate you. Very kind of you. All right. Good guys. Hopefully you guys are following along. This is great so far. You're you're setting the stage for us, George. Love yeah, it. Yeah, I hope I hope no, you're not getting bored. It's it's like I said, this is entertainment. This is just <laughs> scientific truth. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I just put the same slide on that we saw before. We're going to go through the same thing now. Go to the next slide. Um, and scientific methods to verify the sun and moon sizes and distances from Earth. These are the three things. Data services from the Astronomical Applications Department of the U.S. Naval Observatory provides latitude, longitude, altitude, and azimuth locations of the sun or moon for any year, month, day, and minute. And there's the, the website we're going to get into later on. Double triangulation using trigonometric laws of isosceles right triangles. We're going to have to use geometry, but it's pretty basic. And then visual observations. I mean, we can use our own eyes. When we look up at the sun and moon, it's like they, they look like they're the same size. Yeah. You know, but then, oh, well, you, you get the lie. Well, one's way farther away than the other, you know. So we have to trust what we see with our eyes. Um, next chart. So al altitude and azimuth angles locate the sun and moon above the Earth. Altitude and azimuth are angular coordinates which locate the posi position of the sun or moon above the Earth from a specific latitude and longitude location. Altitude is an angular vertical elevation in degrees up to 90 degrees above the horizon. This is important. When the sun or moon are 90 degrees above a specific latitude and longitude location, they are directly above at zenith, and therefore there is no azimuth. You're straight up looking at it. Azimuth is the angular horizontal distance in degrees on the longitude line measured clockwise from north to the sun or moon. When the sun or moon crosses over a longitude line, the altitude elevations are the highest, which is, quote, high noon or, quote, high moon. You know, it depends what, what celestial body is going over across 
the uh, longitude line. The azimuth angle will be 100 degrees looking south at the sun or moon and zero degrees or 360 degrees looking north at the sun or moon when uh, it's high noon or high, high moon. Okay. So I think the next one's going to be graphic. Yeah. There we go. This, this helps. This helps yeah. for sure. So this helps explain what I just said. So you see we have a straight longitude line and then we have a latitude coordinate on that line. So the altitude angle is the altitude vertical angle to where the sun or moon are. And what that angle could be from zero to 90 degrees. Uh, and then the azimuth angle is on the latitude line going from the north, straight north over to where you're seeing the actual location of the sun or moon. And that's, that's the degrees as well. Um, now I just happened to show uh, when you see that zenith, now the straight line down is this 90 degrees altitude. So if, if you see the sun or moon at that point, there would be no zenith because you don't have to. You're, you're out to do straight up and you're, there's no azimuth. So go ahead to the next chart. So now we're going to talk about the, the, the ter certain type of triangle you need to truly do uh, pinpointing the elevation of the sun or moon. This is the trigonometric laws of the isosceles right triangle. So it's a mouthful. Triangle, Say hmm? that one three times. Say that one three times fast. Yeah, I'm gonna lose <laughs> it. I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> so let me just look real quick. If you look at the triangle, point B is 90 degrees angle to the vert and to point C, and then uh, point angle A is 45 degrees angle. Angle C is 45 degrees. This is the only time this will happen. So if we know angle B is 90 degrees of both point C, and we know the hor horizontal distance of A and B, and angle A is 45 degrees, then we're going to know the vertical distance of BC, which equals AB, which is the horizontal distance, and angle C at the top is 45 degrees. Again, remember I said, you know, all triangles have 180 degrees. 180 degrees, you got 90 plus 45 and 45 is 180 degrees. Right. This is triangulation using trigonometry. All lines are straight and the horizontal distance is level or on the horizon. In this case, the horizontal distance AB equals the vertical distance BC. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Is that, I'm trying to think back to high school days. Is this in relation to Pythag the Pythagorean theorem at all? Well, the Pythagorean theorem works for any triangle. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now to improve how we pinpoint the elevation of the sun and the moon, we can use double triangulation <laughs> with the navigational data. And by the way, it took me like a year and a half to figure this out. I just kept racking my brain, racking my brain. And then when I realized, um, you know, uh, basically the distances of, of the, the latitude distances in degrees are actual miles, that made a big difference. And then understanding how to use the data from the navigational data at the website. So now I've got, you know, single triangulation at the top. But if you look, the one on the left, uh, I'm look, getting a north point latitude point. But the one on the right, I'm getting a south point with the same latitude point B in the middle. OK, so I combine those at the bottom one. Right. I just took the two and combined them under at the bottom. So I've still got two isosceles right triangles, but they're both at the same vertical altitude point and I've got same distances to the south or north of it. And that's what I use with the data that we're going to look at. And that 100% proves, you know, what the distances that you're seeing in the data. Okay. You go to the next one. You know, George, this is kind of like, I don't know if you've ever seen that video. It's quite a, quite an older video, but it's a guy at, I think it was Yosemite National Park, and he's recording a rainbow, and all of a sudden, there's like a double rainbow, and he freaks out because it's like a phenomenon, right? And he's like, double yeah. rainbow, it's a double <laughs> rainbow. And here, I want to be like, it's a, it's a double triangulation. You you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. It's even better. <laughs> yeah. So what I did now is I laid on top of this, what we saw before, and um, uh, so now I've got the points that we're going to look because they're going to be all on that same longi longitude line. It has to be because um, that's that's where the sun or the moon is crossing at that time, directly over top of that longitude line. So now we laid that same double triangulation using the isosceles right triangle right on that point. So 
that's what we're going to do. If you go to, and oh, don't move out yet, but we're going to see this all the time. The north latitude point is going to have a 45 degree angle and a 100, 180 degree azimuth. Because look what we're doing. We're going, because it's, it's clockwise. And right now you go clockwise from the north going around. And what is it? It's 180 degrees. It's a half of the circle, right? Okay. That, that's, then that's a key to look at when you look at the data. Always make sure that I've got 180 degrees azimuth on that point. That tells me that it's directly online and it's not skewed. Same way when you look at the south latitude point, we're at 45 degrees angle, but now we're looking north. Okay, so if we took the angle, either it's going to stay at zero or it's going to go all the way around to 360 degrees to get back on the line. And that's what the data will show. Interesting. Uh, so you go to the next one. I just kind of blew it up on the next slide. That's oh, what okay, we're going to do. That's better, we yeah. should have done that before. But uh, that's, okay. that's, that's the model that we use. And it, you'll see it works 100% of the time, all the time. Any, any location of the sun or moon where you get it on any longitude line, any time, we'll show you this data. It, it doesn't change. And that's part of God's Yahweh's law. Mm. Thing. So, okay, let's keep moving. The mastermind okay. behind all this, eh? It's, it's amazing. Uh, yes, he is. Praise him. I just put this up again. You know, we've already seen this before that proves that the total length of a longitude line is 24,856 miles, and each degree of latitude is 69 miles. That's what we have to use. Okay. So I think we're going to start getting into the process. Yeah. Process to determine the location and elevation of the sun at any year, month, day, and minute. So we will select March 20th, 2023, which is the spring equinox. We're going to go to that website. We're going to select sun or moon, select the date in year, month, and day, select the time interval from one minute to two hours. You have an option when you get there. Select the latitude and longitude coordinates. Select time zone east or west of Greenwich Meridian. So go ahead. This, this is the homework of the audience, you guys. You got to follow along. Yeah. Go to the screen, go to that website and, and do this just to, to try it out. Yep. So we'll play, I'll, I'll have to talk through this as it goes. Okay. Okay. Yep. So we're at the website now, altitude and azimuth of the sun and moon during one day. Uh, you can see uh, that there, I think I'm going to highlight the web there. It is right there. I highlighted it up above. And now you can see we're going to start going through this and changing the parameters. So I'll go down here, select sun, then I'll select the date. I got to go to March and I can pick 20th. So I just put in the date. I'm going to do uh, one minute intervals. That's the best to do because I got to get it exact where it's at, the location. And then I'm going to put the latitude and longitudes in here. Now, I've, 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 you're going to do a lot of iterations to do this, which I've already done. Okay. Hmm. Um, so it takes a couple of iterations to try to locate it, them sometimes. So this is the cheat sheet. This is the final, yeah, answer. <laughs> So based on that longitude line, I had to put the hours for Greenwich Meridian, okay? So that's all the parameters, and you can see it says get data. So I'm going to stop at the video right now, go back to the slide chart, and tell it, explain we just inputted all this stuff. This is what we put inputted in there, okay? So all the parameters have been provided. Object is, object is the sun, date is March 2023, spring equinox, tabular interval is one minute. Location is plus 45 degrees latitude. The reason I picked that, guess why? Because the sun is on the equator. So if I go to plus 45 degrees, um, there's a 45, it turns out there's a 45 degree angle of latitude, which is the same as the triangle angle. And there's a minus 149.9 degree longitude. Time zone is 10 hours west of Greenwich Meridian. I have already gone through iterations of determining the longitude line where the sun crosses over the equator at 0, 0.00 latitude on March 20th, 2023, and the north and south latitude along the longitude line where the altitudes to the sun are 45 degrees. Now we will select get data. So go back to the next, you'll go to the next video. So we're going to hit get data and then we'll scroll. Okay. Video five or the same video, one? Video five, video five. Yeah, okay. Okay, gotcha. So this is the output. We're going to get the data now. 
So see, we've got everything's pre-selected. I'm sorry, here we go. Here we go. So it's all been selected. I'm gonna hit that get data. And we're gonna go through this uh, for the three points that we need, the data that we're looking for. So this shows you that's for the sun, time, altitude, and azimuth, okay? So what I'm gonna do is go down and see when I find the azimuth is 180 degrees, perfectly 180 degrees, and we'll see that, uh, we'll get the time on that, and we're gonna get that it's 45 degrees altitude angle is what we want, because we're trying to stay with the isosceles right triangle when we do this. Right you can see as it scrolls down on the right, you see the numbers getting higher. We're looking for 180 degrees, perfect. There it is. Time 1207, 45 degrees, 180 degrees. So we got our first data point uh, uh, north of where the sun is. So now I'm going to go back and re I'm going to input data now. All I'm going to change is the latitude because we're on the same longitude. I'm going to go to the equator. Okay, because okay. the sun is right above the equator right now. We got our first data point, 45 degree angle, looking to the sun, perfect azimuth. And now we're going to get the same time because it's on the same timeline, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to see that it's 90 degrees altitude angle, zenith, and there's no azimuth because we're looking straight up at it. There it is, 1207, altitude angle is 90. We don't worry about the azimuth because it's, there's no azimuth, it's straight up. So that's our second point. Now we're going to go minus 45 latitude. So we're going to go 45 latitude degrees south. Okay. okay. Same distance as we did north. We're going to scroll down, same time. And we're going to look for the 90 degrees. I mean, the 45 degrees angle with either a zero or 360 degrees azimuth. That means we're right on that longitude line looking north. 1207, 45 degrees, 360 degrees. So we got the perfect alignment. This makes that triangle right on that line. We've got all our data points now. And now we can show it. Actually, I show a table for it. Okay, so that's the next one. The next slide would be the uh, information. Here we go. So that's the summary data. Sun location, March 20th, 2023, minus 149.90 longitude line. Uh, our time is the same, 12.07. So now plus 45, uh, you know, 12.07, altitude angle is 45 degrees, 180 degrees south. Zero equator, 12.07, it's 90 degrees angle straight up. And then we go minus 45 degrees. This is latitude angles. Uh, going south, 45 degrees. So now the table below, here we go. Latitude is minus, is plus 45 degrees. The equator is zero. So we've got 45 degrees difference in latitude. 69 miles per degree. So now we're at 3,107 miles. On one those are, mile. That's that's an interesting number right there, isn't it? Yes. And for those who don't know, what's the significance of that number? What did you just... Okay, we'll, we'll show it in a minute. So basically, oh, okay. we're showing the horizontal. But this is the horizontal distances, right? On, on right, that yeah. longitude line. So then the other one going south is 00, zero equator minus 45. Still, the difference is 45 degrees, 69 miles per degree. We got the exact same distances. We're doing the double triangulation of the isosceles right triangle. So now go to the next slide. What I want to do first, okay, this, <laughs> I want to do this purposely. This is how it shows on the Gleason's map, okay? Those are the locations. The sun is on the equator. We got the plus 45 latitude north, and we got the minus 45 latitude south. Then I'm looking at the globe map, which has got some curvature on it, right? But here we go. You know, it's the same longitude lines. We got the sun on the equator, it goes plus and minus 45. Um, so, what my point here is that both maps show the same thing. And actually when you look at it, okay, yeah, we're somewhere in the ocean and we're somewhere in the ocean on the globe map. You know, we're, we're on the equator, we're on the equator and look, we're getting close to, um, you know, the upper part of the Pacific here with 
with the, on the United States. So they, you know, the maps look close. This mm -hmm. is my point right there. Then the next slide, this is the data using the double triangulation. So uh, this is exactly what the data that we got from the information. We're mar look at the longitude line, March 20th, 2023, minus 149, 90 longitude, time 1207 all across the line. That plus 45 degree latitude happens to be 45 degrees altitude. Our azimuth is, is basically 180 degrees because we're looking south, straight south on the line. There's 3,107 miles between that point and the equator because it's 45 degrees of latitude. And we know that that's 3,107 miles. The zenith is directly above at 90 degrees. Then we go to that minus 45 degree latitude on the south, still 45 degree angle. And our looking north, we're 360 degrees north. We actually went around from north all the way around back to it. So the double triangulation, both sides prove that the vertical altitude of the sun is 3,107 miles. There it is. It's Brother, you're, you're, you're missing an exclamation mark after that <laughs> statement. Yeah, right. That's huge, guys. If you didn't, know, you didn't yeah. hear that, that yeah. that's, uh, that's not yeah. 93 million miles away. No, it's not. It's very close, very close. And, you know, when you think about it, you get into you know, the biblical models that you do for the creation. Um, it's got to be, you know, it's probably in, in the second firmament. I think that's where it's at because I think that's where you show it. And I, I believe that now, you know. Mm. Uh, but anyway, we don't want to. It is exciting. When I first saw this, I said, oh, my gosh, this is <laughs> really true, you know. Um, that's amazing. So let's keep going. And I want to show, this is how you disprove the globe map. And I think Yahweh laughs at this. He purposely made, he created it this way. So when we look and we put the 45 degree angle, uh, out, altitude angle, guess what happens on the globe? It's parallel lines. It's crazy. This is exactly because, uh, right? You look at there's 90 degrees north. This now on this line is actually the longitude minus 149.90. There is the equator here, right? So we know that um, 45 degrees on the globe is 3,107 miles, right? It's just like it is on the circular level plane. But when you have to, because we have a, we have to do a, a level here, which is the horizon, that's 45 degrees. So there, and that's the distance right there. That's truly 3,107 miles that we have. And, and there's the other angle low, 3,107 miles, and they're just parallel. <laughs> wow. So no triangulation because there's 90 degrees of curvature on the globe Earth. <laughs> isn't, isn't that wild? It is wild. That's, I think, that's quite the obstruction. Yes, it? I think the Yahweh laughs at that. Yeah. I do too with them now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, now... Let's try to move through this. I don't want, you know, we're, we're doing well, brother. We're doing well. What I wanted to do is, because we know how, how important it is spring equinox is uh, for, not for the Gregorian calendar because they don't care. But we know it's important for those of us that follow Yahweh's calendar or better, trying to better understand it. So what I did is I did some data for March 17th through the 23rd. And I kind of highlighted these things here just real quick. We don't need to go over a lot. But what I'm trying to do is pinpoint where the sun is, you know, a couple of days before and after. OK, so go to the next slide. And this is what happened. Um, when you look at this, uh, you look at the sun coming here. It's coming from the south and it comes each day a little bit more north because it travels north to south between the latitude lines of top of Cancer and Capricorn. So March 20th, yeah, it looks like it's lined up, you know, mm. with that equator. Uh, no, so I say it appears, but, you know, I, I, I wouldn't trust the data yet at all. I mean, I th you know, I, I don't think Azazel would tell the truth ever. <laughs> you know? He's known to be a liar. Yeah, but I just thought this would be interesting to see, you know, and it looked like, wow, yeah. that data looks pretty on top for that time for in 2023. Just a, something to think about, you know. Mm. So now we're gonna do the process for the moon. We're gonna do the same thing. Here's the data, we're gonna do the same thing. So we don't need to spend a whole lot of time going through the process, but sure. I'm gonna still use the same day, okay, March 20th. So we'll go ahead and show the input video six. There we go. 
So we're at the same site. All I'm going to do now is change from the sun to the moon. Okay, where am I? Okay, I'm showing the website again. Same same location in the website. And I'm going to scroll down, go to the moon, same date. And I can't remember what I did. Okay, I, I changed the longitude line a little bit. Again, I did pre iteration on it so that we, you know, that takes the time too. It's harder to find the moon than it is for the sun because I know pretty much, you know, where it's going uh, based, based on the seasons, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the moon's elusive. But, but the moon is is crazy. It, it goes different latitudes all the time. I mean, it's just bouncing around. And so I put all the data in this time. Same date, but I did tweak the uh, latitude line a little bit. Uh, I think that's it. So, yeah. Okay. And then go to the next slide. So, again, we basically, the parameters, object, it's a moon, date, same date, time interval, one minute. And the location is plus 36.45 degrees and minus 149.82. I changed them because I already I had to locate where they were at. That way we don't go through all this iteration. So I said, like I said, I've already done this. So I know, I already know that the, um, look, the moon is located at minus 7.89 latitude when we do the data. So let's get the data. You'll see it. <clears throat> Seven. Hope you guys are loving this. This is, uh, yeah, it's meaty for sure. Out there. <laughs> well, I mean, it's meaty. It is, but yeah, it is it's necessary. Okay. I, I think I hit play, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, so now I'm just going to go down there and get data. We're going to look for the same parameters again. We're going to look for the first point, which is the north point. We're looking for time. We're looking for altitude to be 45 degrees. Now, also, this shows a fraction of illumination on that. So the right side tells you what the moon illumination is. Okay, the, cool. The time, there's time, and then there's the altitude, and then there's the azimuth, and then the Final one on the fourth is the uh, percent illuminated. So we're looking for 45 degrees and 180 azimuth. We're getting close to it. There it is. I think it's time 1131, 45 degrees, 180 azimuth. And then we can see what the, uh, the moon's only, it's almost a new moon. It's 0 0.01 illumination. So now I'm going to change it to where the actual moon location is, 90 degrees up. Yeah. Taking me too much time on there to put it in. <laughs> there it goes. Double checking the data. Yeah. And this will tell us we're looking for that same time. And now it should be 90 degrees with zero azimuth. Same illumination of the moon, though. There it is, 1131. 90 degrees altitude. Don't worry about the zenith because it's straight up. Okay, so uh, we can get out of this video now. And oh, no, we got to do oh. one more. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 I, I, too sure, soon. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm going to go for the southern point, which would be 45 degrees. Uh, at either zero or 360 degrees, same time, 1131. They always match up. They have to. This stuff's yeah. important, guys. I know, I know it's, it it's is. proving local luminaries, right? Yes. They're... Yep. yep. Okay. Next slide. So here's the data that we got. And we're going to do the same thing now. But what I noticed when I delved into this information, uh, when I looked for the 45 degree altitude angle, it turned out when you look at this, uh, when you look at the second plus 36.45 minus 7.89, it's 44.34 latitude difference. So it's like it took me a while to realize that when I was finding the 45 degree altitude. So then you multiply that by 69. You get 3,062 miles. 
And then when you do it on the south side, same thing, the, the difference is 44.34 miles times 69 is 3,062 miles. So that's telling me that, oh, the moon's a little bit lower in elevation than the sun. Hmm, mm. didn't know that. So go to the next slide. And this, we'll just do it again. The moon is at, there's the equator, it's minus 7.89 south. And there's a location with a 45 degree angle, but that distance now is 44.34 latitude. The altitude angle is 45 degrees. Same with that up north here. Again, when you look at the maps, you know, they're cl really close on the maps, but I'm just trying to prove that, you know, that the fake globe Earth has the same latitude and longitude points. But then let's go to the next slide and it'll show us, here we go. Using that double triangulation, and I put up here, the moon is 1% illuminated, which tells us that the moon is very close to the sun, mm -hmm. which, right? And that's yeah. interesting. You'll, you'll find out in Enoch how that kind of works, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So again, we got the data that we're basically at four, the angles are the same 45 degrees, but the distance was only 44.34, which changed that distance to 3062 north or south, which means the vertical altitude is 3062. Double, tri double triangulation proves the moon is 3062 miles above sea level. Boom. Another wahoo. Um, yeah. So let's go to the next slide. And again, using the globe map, <laughs> That line here showing the, uh, you know, how it runs at 3,062 miles. They're almost parallel lines again. They're not quite. They're 88.68, but they never they never converge. They never converge mm -hmm. on on the globe map. So this proves it. Let's go to the next slide. So now we know the moon center moon locations on March 20th. So you can see. The sun is about to approach the moon. I had to do some time things here going on because it depends on the longitude lines where we see them and how the sun moves. The sun moves four, um, four minutes per degrees and the moon is a little slower, 4.14 minutes per degree, by the way. So that's why the sun can circle, can lap the moon once every 29.9 days. That's just to tell you that they're right on, they're right above the circular earth and that's where they're at. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah. She she lags behind a bit, the moon does. Yes, she does. This is kind of a summary thing telling you, you know, the moon, time difference, the moon is 36 minutes west of the sun because the sun is catching up, which is about 8.7 degrees. But <laughs> elevation above sea level, sun 3107, the moon 3062. Sun is 45 miles above the moon. Something else I didn't know until I still got it. amazing. Into that's amazing. Yeah. So let's go yeah. to the next slide. One of the one of the people here in the corner, where does it say? Um, Michael Jameson says the moon has to be lower elevation. That's right. On for eclipses to work, yes. That's right, because that's how they use the uh, <laughs> they use the angle thing. <laughs> so we're going to go through now the different because you want to know, okay, how's the sun moving? Right, we know that it was on the equator, so okay, well it's going north for the next season. June 21st. So this is a summary data. I'm not, we know the process and this is the data that we got. Um, so again, when you, I'm going to look at the bottom here, we still have the 45 degrees going on. This is at June 21st. So that doesn't change at all. The sun, whenever we get tri double triangulation is always 3,107 miles. Okay. <laughs> and it, folks, you can get online and put these numbers in and check it for yourself. It'll, it'll pop up. It'll be there. Go to the next slide. And there it is. So we're going to run through these pretty quick because the same data information, just trying to prove anywhere the sun goes, north or south, in any point, this is what you get. Okay. And go, cool. go to the next slide. Same thing with the moon. This is the moon information, 3062 elevation. And here we go again. That's the summer solstice. That's where they're at. Sun's here. Moon's here. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm using an arrow. You guys can't see what I'm looking at. But that's where the sun and moon are at that time. And then yeah. if sun, you guys can't see, it's it's on the right side. Like if it's like a clock, it's kind of like at uh, what is that? Maybe one 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 o'clock and four o'clock ish. Yeah. And so moon, the moon and the sun. At, if you look at the uh, meridian line, the sun is in the minus one time zone. The moon is in the plus two time time zone on the right. Yeah. Yep. The tropical cancer area there. Yeah. Yep, right. So. 
And that's a summary data. Again, we're seeing the same data, sun and the moon are the same elevation, sun's 45 miles above, above the moon. And we can tell moon illumination is 11%. Um, the sun has already gone by past the moon. The sun always moves faster than well, the moon. So it's going farther away from it. Hmm. The yeah, the, yeah the, sun's, the sun's chariot is a little quicker than the moon's. Yes, yes. Yeah. Then September 23rd, we're going back on the fall equinox. Same thing. 317, 3107. Go to the next slide. I mean, these things just are repeatable. It's just <laughs> scientifically repeatable and provable. Yes. Okay? That's, that's the scientific method. That's what we're looking yep. for. Yep. And there's the moon, 3062. There's the data. You can check it out. Uh, there's the double triangulation. And there they, that's where they are. So uh, the sun is uh, on the equator again because it's on plus time plus six on the equator. Yeah. The moon is just on time plus 12, way past Cap Capricorn. It's, the moon goes farther latitude north and south than the sun does. It's really interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, the next slide. So now that's the summary. See that the moon is 58%. That's why we have the farther distance. But again, uh, we see the same data every time we do this. And it's all the time on this. It's this really, truth. really neat, really neat. Um, so now we're in the winter solstice, same information for the sun, same thing. And this is proving, again, what Enoch talks about, how the sun moves, and hopefully we'll get to it, the gates. The, the gates, gates, yeah. 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 Um, same information, which is a blessing. It never changes. And Yahweh's laws never change. Mm -hmm. Same thing for the moon. There you go. That's the location. Uh, the sun is on top of Capricorn on minus time minus nine and the moon is uh on minus one near the tropic of cancer yeah, yeah. Let's see it there yep yeah. yep so and there's the data um just provable time and time so here we go results elevations of the sun and moon we've proven that this is a constant elevations of both the sun and moon during their seasons, which means they pretty much have gone through a full year, okay? Because, you know, the spring equinox is going to be back on the equator again. They're all, the sun's elevation is always 3,107 miles. The moon's always 3,062. The sun is always 45 miles above the moon. There you go. Uh, this is scientifically always repeatable for any year, month, day, and minute using double triangulation along any longitude line where the sun or moon's latitude coordinate is in an angle. Altitude angle is 90 degrees zenith. Since we now know the real distance of the sun and moon from the Earth, we can determine their sizes. Mm -hmm. right? So that's what we're going to do next. So when we visually observe the sun and moon in the sky, most of the day they look to be the same size. But now we're going to apply something that NASA tells everybody. Applying NASA's distance to diameter ratios which is perspective for the sun and moon to the altitudes of the sun and moon determined by the U.S. Naval Observatory data and double triangulation, the sun and moon are just about the same as we observe in our eyes. So what this the, Na the NASA table shows is that this is what they say. The sun is 93 million miles from the Earth, and the diameter is 870,000 miles. So if we do a distance to the diameter ratio, that's 106.9. So let's go over to the, look at the moon, sun first. Now we know from the data, the true distance is 3,107 miles. So if I use the same 106.9, this is the diameter ratio. The diameter of the sun is 29 miles, okay? Wow. So do the same thing with the moon. They say, NASA says the distance from the Earth is 238,855 miles, and the diameter is 2,160. Take that ratio which is 110.58. Then when we look at the moon's distance and use the distance to diameter, same one, 110.58, it's 28 miles. So boom, we're seeing they're pretty much, they're the same size. And I actually, uh, during the June, I actually made my own, um, uh, it was like a box I made with a 
my own distance to diameter ratio. And I had to make the, the diameter 160. Little pinhole. Inch. Yeah. Pinhole and the distance was seven, seven inches. And I determined the location of the sun where it was. So then I took the sighting when I knew I had to take it. And I came up with like uh, 31 miles. So it was like, wow, you know, that's, that's it. We know that's that, amazing. We know better truth. So this is mind blowing, right? I mean, yeah. all, all my life, I was told the sun is exponentially bigger than the earth. Well, let's right? keep going. Yeah. Let's keep going. Yeah, for sure. So here, here's the big boom, you know, the sun and the moon are the same size between 28 to 30 miles in diameter. The moon's always 45 miles below the sun. The Earth's diameter is 24,856 miles. So when we look at the sun and moon's diameter, let's say it's 30. <laughs> the Earth is 820 times a little larger in diameter than the sun or moon. It's huge. Yet NASA, they tell us the sun is 100 times larger than the Earth. You know, NASA and mainstream science lie and hide the truth. So if you think about it now, how can a circular level plane Earth that is 820 times larger than the sun circle the sun? It's impossible. So now we know that the Earth is a stationary clock and the sun is the Earth's timepiece circling the Earth clockwise, one full 360 degree rotation, a revolution a day. I mean, this is, and look right there, when you're seeing that, you can't even see the sun and the moon. I put them in perspective size compared to the Earth. Oh, okay. You'd have to zoom you. in there big time to, to see it, I see which I did, did on the there. PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, it's crazy. That's amazing. Crazy. So, so God, Yahweh's truth about the sun and the, the earth and the sun is much a grandiose truth than the little lie that NASA says. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen, brother. Go to the next slide for you. Yep. 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 So now we're going to get to, so we've scientifically proven this, is what I like to do with my presentation. We've proven by science, you know, what's going on with the sun and moon, it's ele their elevation and their sizes. And this one is talking about navigational data of the sun is always in agreement with first Enoch's description of the sun. The navigational data of the sun from the observatory that we look at shows that the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. First Enoch 72.2. And this is the first law of luminaries. The luminary of the sun has its rising in the eastern portals of, portals of the heaven and its setting in the western portals of the heaven. The sun is an earth clock and constantly circles clockwise, one revolution every 24 hours a day. So there, now we're getting scripture that tells us the truth that we actually observe and scientifically proved. Amen. Brother, can you can you put your, maybe wave your hand in front of your camera real quick? You, you're out of focus. Just like bring oh. your, your hand right to where your uh, webcam is. Oh. And just let it kind of, yeah, and then take it back. Oh, okay. No, it didn't work. Yeah, you, you're out of focus for some reason. Your camera decided it wanted to to blur you a little bit huh. that's okay that's okay if it doesn't normally yeah normally if you just kind of put it right up there and then there we go okay. you're back you're back right. i want to right. see that beautiful face you know <laughs> all right all right so this is a just simple video now that we know this is a sun circling the earth i think uh for a day okay, okay. very simple the navigational data of the sun is always in agreement with first enoch's description of the sun the navigational data of the sun from the United States Naval Observatory always shows the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. First Enoch 72.2. And this is the first law of the luminaries. The luminary of the sun it has its rising in the eastern portals of the heaven and its setting in the western portals of the heaven. The sun is the Earth's clock and constantly circles one revolution every 24 hours a day, which we will see next. Awesome. We got some movement. That's sweet. And this is really for people that don't understand, you know, how it works with the sun actually being the one moving, right? Most people yeah. would think the other way. So this is showing the truth now that we know the true sizes and elevation of them. Perfect. The sun and moon are luminaries and lights. NASA and mainstream science has lied about the sun and moon sizes and distances from the Earth. We can no longer trust anything NASA and mainstream science says, including their statement that the sun is a gaseous fireball and the moon is a spherical mass, especially since we know these scientific facts already now. 
Um, so I've used a Nikon P1000 camera quite a bit since I got it back in 2022, early 2022. And I can prove that, you know, the sun is a light and not a gaseous fireball and the moon is a light, not a spherical mass. Next slide. So we're going to see a video of the sun. And I used a double filter on my camera to protect it, obviously. But when you do that, you see really what the sun's about. Right. Sure yeah, this is, this is good. So this is May 20, May 2nd, 2023. And it shows different time when I took, took the uh, pictures. And you can see, if you look hard, there are like pinholes on the um, surface of the sun's disk. But you don't see any mat fireball mass. You don't see anything blowing out from it. It's a light. It's nothing but a light. It's a yeah. beautiful light. That's what it looks like. But those pinholes, they're there and they continue to stay in the same configuration as the, the disc is rotating clockwise. Um, and the pinholes really are uh, what I'd say the mainstream science use as their excuse to say, well, there's solar flares that come out of those. I, I quite frankly think that that's some kind of way that the sun and the moon charge and they, they electromagnetically relate to each other. Okay. Mm. Um, and it's still Figured. moving. You see, it's yeah. uh, we're getting later here in the day and you see the configuration of the pinholes or whatever we're seeing on there, uh, staying the same, same configuration. Yeah. That's wild, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. And you know, with a, a P1000 camera like that, I've zoomed in on the surface surface of the disc and I, 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 all it is is a light. You don't see anything but light. You know, I think that's yeah. the end of it there. Perfect. Yeah, it's it's interesting when I saw that video. Um, yeah. Just seeing how, like you said, how it goes clockwise and, and those yeah. little what look like pinholes they stay in their same location as it's yeah. turning and it's, it doesn't like heal itself you know what i mean there isn't any right. weird yeah just, there, there definitely is, yeah yep what i'd like to do sometime is have somebody do the same thing on the south side of, of the sun I, i've been yeah. trying to talk to some folks like down in uh, um, uh, australia like especially for the moon like i asked somebody i said well does the moon rotate clockwise on your side yeah it does well if it does it rotates clockwise on our side then it's, it's doing this on different sides. I, I, you know, that's something I want to really look into. Mm. Um, but here's a summary of what we just saw. Um, you know, we proved that the sun is not a gaseous fireball mass, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm guilty of using those images in my thumbnails and pictures and stuff like that, right? <laughs> it, it, you can... It's like a traditional way of differentiating between the sun and the moon is just this like fiery right. bright light, right? right. But, but maybe I'll have to start using that image, brother, with, with the there little panels. Yeah. 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 So then we go to the next slide. So there you go. This, uh, what we see, that's the truth is it, it's uh, electromagnetic magnetic light. Not it's a not a, a nuclear fusion reactor exploding a million times. Right. Yeah. That's what they, <laughs> that's what they say it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's take a look at the moon. I think this was uh, a full moon when I did this one. Um, so, yeah, but you'll notice it rotates clockwise as well over time. I think it goes from May 4th into the morning of uh, May 5th. Uh, so, and if you look at the configuration, you'll see those three dots. That's the one I use all the time. But you see it rotating clockwise. And the, nothing changes in that. It's the surface of that thing. It's the same all the time. Um, and I, you really can't prove in this situation that that's a light, but that's why I did the 31 video series of a lunar cycle going from full moon to full moon that specifically shows with a Nikon camera with video and pictures of how the light either increases or decreases depending on how close the sun is to the moon. It, mm -hmm. It's scientific Very evidence cool. again. Very cool. Yeah. Is it just repeating the same video on that? Goes on. That's for the moon. Okay, yeah. I think we're done. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, for the characteristics, you know, moon is bright and full of light. 
and I comment on the, about this moon surface that they say is gray and dark dust. Well, how can it really reflect light, right? It couldn't reflect light. Um, and same thing about unique shapes of darker and lighter areas, which are always the same configuration. They don't change. Uh, these unique shapes of darker and lighter areas of the moon may be the result of an electromagnetic charging and discharging relationship with the sun. So the moon is a light, just like Yahweh says, and not a mass. Keep going here. So here we go. Enoch's got a lot of great verses on this. Sun and moon are lights and are the same size. And this is the law, Enoch. First Enoch 72, 35 to 37. This is the law in the journey of the sun and its return. As often as it returns, 60 times it returns and rises. That is the great eternal light, which forever and ever is named the sun. And that this that rises is a great light, which is named after its appearance, as the Lord commanded. And thus it rises and sets. It neither decreases nor rests, but runs day and night in its chariot. And its light, its light is seven times brighter than that of the moon, but in size the two are equal. First Enoch 78.3. There are two great lights. Their discs are like discs of heaven, and in size, the two are equal. So there you go. There's yeah, the it's, a, it's amazing. I, I released a video a couple of years ago pulling from these passages out of First Enoch. And, you know, the, the mainstream narrative is like, you know, science wants to tell us that the sun is essentially going to die, right? right? After however million years down the road, like the sun will die out and right. all of humanity and everything within our galaxy is going to like, get sucked in and it's nonsense guys the, the, the scriptures yahweh's made a covenant with these lights it's it's yep. you know called it the great eternal mm -hmm. light it's eternal has a meaning it's never going away yes he, he's going to manipulate it on the day of the lord mm -hmm. and days leading up to right. the day of the lord he's gonna he's gonna you know mask the luminaries in, in a sense um right. for the plan of his you know arrival with his son so but that's not to say that the sun and moon are going away. He's got an right. eternal covenant with them as well. They're going to continue to perpetually do their circuit above, right. um, close right. to us. So, yep. yeah. Yep. So I think we've got a lot of things in here about, you know, scriptures about uh, sun and moon or lights. This is actually coming from the canon. So, you know, people that only believe in the canon, you know, uh, Genesis says, God, Genesis 1, 14 to 19, that God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light on the earth. And it was so, then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Would you mind reading Jubilees, Ken? Absolutely. Jubilees 2, 8 to 10 says, And on the fourth day, he created the sun and the moon and the stars and set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon all the earth and to rule over the day and the night and divide the light from the darkness. And God appointed the sun to be a great sign on the earth for days and for Sabbaths and for months and for feasts and for years and for Sabbaths of years and for Jubilees and for all seasons of the years. And it divides the light from the darkness and for prosperity that all things may prosper, which shoot and grow on the earth. These three kinds he made on the fourth day. Amen. And that, that key there is you know, when you look at the point of the sun to be a great sign on the earth for days, Sabbaths, months, feasts, years, Sabbaths, jubilees, seasons of the years. I mean, that's the sun is the clock, is the clock that God made for time. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100% agree. Yeah. And it's... um. It's amazing because, I mean, I, I love in Jubilees where it ends with these three kinds he mm -hmm. made on the fourth day. That, that, that differentiates the luminaries, right? And yeah. again, science wants to tell us that the sun is a star, right? And right. all the stars we see are suns. And and that's yeah. just not the case. You know, that's right. not what Yahweh had made. They're, it's its own kind. And yeah. brother, I was going to ask you. Yeah. Thoughts on triangulation in regards to the stars, is that at all a possibility? Because in no. my understanding and estimation, I, I put, according to the Apocalypse of Abraham, I believe, the, mm -hmm. the stars are quite a bit further up in a different right. firmament layer above where the sun and moon are contained. Yeah, I haven't gotten that far yet, but yeah, that's a good point, you know, because obviously there are stars that the navigators were using uh, to know where they were located, um, but they haven't gotten that far yet. But Yeah. 
Yeah. It's great. But because really right now I'd have to look for some kind of data for that. Um, you know, because the sun and the moon, a lot of data on that website that I'm referring to, and this is the Naval Observatory. They are the ones for the navigation for the earth, you know, uh, here's more, um, scriptures, the sun and the moon are lights, Isaiah 13, 10, for the stars of heaven and the constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and it's going forth and the moon will not cause its light to shine. This is when you're talking about, you know, the day of the Lord. Isaiah, Isaiah 30, 26, moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of the seven days, in the day that the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. Isaiah 60, 19, the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God your glory. Jeremiah 31, 35, thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for, by, for a light by night, whose disturbs it sees, and the waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. Ezekiel 32, 7, when I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. You go to the next yes. one. All, all prophetic, eschatologically related um, yeah. scriptures in my opinion and i know isaiah yeah. 60 verse 19 some people could be like wait wait a minute doesn't that say that this the the moon won't be you know the brightness of the moon won't have anything to do with you because yahweh will be to you well when you understand the new jerusalem coming down on the day of the lord and yahweh and all the angels and all the glorified saints in the resurrected bodies of light are going to be in there it's gonna be a bright space right, right? so we won't have necessarily the need for the sun and the moon inside to provide light because we're going right. to be inside of a giant light box yeah yeah exactly do you mind reading this one ken yeah matthew 24 29 says immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then mark 13 24 says but in those days after that tribulation the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light yeah Right. Yeah. So we got a sun and a moon, separate lights. Yeah. Right. Yep. It's right there. And it's interesting how uh, pastors, especially now, they don't, they'll, they'll see the words light, but they don't accept it. <laughs> they see the word. Yeah. Now, there was a pastor that I was watching, used, the church I used to go to. He's going through Genesis and he says, Genesis is all about Jesus. So he, he says, I know Genesis. That's what he said. So he gets to the part about the sun and the moon, and he just totally, he reads the word light, but then when they show a depiction, it's the heliocentric model. It's like, oh my gosh, you know. But we were there at one time. Cog disc. It's the cog disc. It's hard to, it can be hard to yes. penetrate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, results of the navigational data from the U.S. Naval Observatory double triangulation. Uh, we're talking now, we're looking at how the sun really moves. So we're seeing that the, the sun on March 20th, the sun is traveling north and crosses over the equator on June 8th. Well, I got that wrong. That should be a different date. should be June 21st. The sun crosses over the Tropic of Cancer and begins traveling south. On September 23rd, fall equinox, the sun crosses over the equator and travels uh, south continuously. On December 21st, should be there, the sun crosses over the Tropic of Capricorn and begins traveling north. The sun continues to travel north, and the, the day before the sun crosses over the equator again con constitutes one year cycle. So, bottom line, the sun traveling north and south causes a seasonal change. It's not the Earth, <laughs> Earth rotating exactly. on an ax axis and going an ellip elliptical circuit around the sun. The yeah. sun is doing itself, the seasonal yeah. change. I get a lot of people, George, just asking about, you know, well, what about the seasons? How can how can how can there be seasonal changes on right. a flat Earth, right? And it's like it's actually it much is, easier. Right? It's right much here. easier to understand the, right. the globular Earth, yeah. And you know, and again, we get back to uh, before you play that, we get back to you know when we look at this uh, sun and moon, they look to be the same size. They have to be close to each other. They have to be close to each other when they're the same when they really are the same size, like thirty miles or whatever. Because if they weren't, then we'd see they're not the same size, but they're so close as far as, you know, vertical elevation. Now, we will be, you do see some differences depending on where they're at. And I'm going to do a little study on that, maybe a whole lot. But when the sun, like, you know, and it's coming back uh, north now, but when it was farthest point, 
if I was to look at it on the line, longitude line, even though it's crossing over the, uh, the noon on my longitude line, when I took a picture of it at the same, say, zoom level, it's going to be smaller than I would when it's closest to me in the summer because right. it's just closer, right? So yeah. there's that perspective. So there would be some difference. You can't see with the naked eye, but you can pick it up on an icon camera, you know? Yeah, I mean, because a, a 30 mile diameter um, orb, when it's closer, right, depending on which gate it's at, depending on which, you exactly. know, part of the season it's at, it, you'll still, it's a sizable object in the sky, but when it's further down, and if the Earth is, as we're, as you're claiming, in diameter, it's yeah. huge, and it's covering a, a massive area, right? right? And so yeah. it's going to look smaller the further away it is, depending on where right. you're at and which country. Yeah, it's great. Exactly. So I guess we'll go ahead and do that, play that video now. This, oh, yeah, here we go. It's good latitude lines plus 23.40 degrees tropic of cancer and minus 23.40 degrees tropic of cat capricorn which controls the earth seasons is always in agreement with first enoch first enoch 72 8 when the sun rises in the heaven he comes forth through that fourth gate 30 mornings in succession and sets accurately in the fourth gate in the west of the heaven fourth gate is month one which is 30 days First Enoch 7211, and the sun rises from that fourth gate and sets in the fourth and returns to the fifth gate of the east 30 mornings, and it rises from it and sets in the fifth gate. Fifth gate is month two, and it's 30 days long. First Enoch 7213, and it returns to the east and enters to the sixth gate and rises and sets in the sixth gate 31 mornings on account of its sign. Sixth gate is month three, which has 31 days, and as the seasons changed to summer solstice. First Enoch 72:15, and the sun mounts up to make the day shorter and the night longer, and the sun returns to the east and enters into the sixth gate, and rises from it and sets 30 mornings. The sixth gate is month four, which is 30 days long. First Enoch 72:17. And the sun goes forth from that sixth gate in the west and goes to the east and rises in the fifth gate for 30 mornings and sets in the west again in the fifth western gate. Fifth gate is month five, which is 30 days. First Enoch 72:19. And the sun goes forth from that fifth gate and sets in the fifth gate of the west and rises in the fourth gate for 31 mornings on account of its sign and sets in the west. The fourth gate is month six and has 31 days and is a season's change to fall equinox. First Enoch 72, 21. And the sun rises from that gate and sets in the west and returns to the east and rises 30 mornings in the third gate and sets in the west in the third gate. Third gate is month seven and has 30 days. First Enoch 72, 23. And the sun rises from that third gate and sets in the third gate in the west and returns to the east and for 30 mornings rises in the second gate in the east, and in like manner sets in the second gate in the west of the heaven. Second gate is month eight, which has 30 days. First Enoch 72:25, And the sun rises on that day from the second gate, and sets in the west in the second gate, and returns to the east in the first gate for 31 mornings, and sets in the first gate in the west of the heaven. First gate is month nine, which is 31 days and is a season change to winter solstice. Okay. First Enoch 72, 27. And the sun has herewith transversed the divisions of its, his circuit and turns again on those divisions of his circuit and enters that gate, the first gate, 30 mornings, and sets also in the west opposite it. The first gate equals month 10, which is 30 days in length. First Enoch 72, 29. And the sun has returned and entered to the second gate in the east and returns in those his divisions of his orbit for 30 mornings, rising and setting. Second gate is month 11 and has 30 days. First Enoch 72, 31 to 32. And on that day, the sun rises from that portal and sets in the west and returns to the east and rises in the third gate for 31 mornings and sets in the west of the heaven. On that day, the night decreases and amounts to nine parts and the day to nine parts. And the night is equal to the day, and the year is exactly, as to its days, 364. First gate is month 12, has 31 days. It's a season change to spring equinox. 
First Enoch 72, 35, 37. And this is the law in the course of the sun. And his return is often as he returns 60 times and rises. The great luminary, which is named the sun forever and ever. And that which therefore rises is the great luminary and is so named according to its appearance, according as the Lord commanded. As he rises, so he sets and decreases not and rests not, but runs day and night. And his light is sevenfold brighter than that of the moon. But as regards size, they are both equal. The navigational data from the United States Naval Observatory of the sun traveling north and south between the tropics is in full agreement to first Enoch. Enoch states a year is exactly 364 days, the length of each month 30 days, and four seasonal change days. A 364-day calendar year is perfectly designed so that dates never change. The world's calendar of a 365.25-day year or 366-day year results dates changing every year to different days of the week. Next, we will see the sun traveling north and south for a full year which is based on the navigational data from the United States Naval Observatory and is exactly as described in 1st Enoch. Each gate described in 1st Enoch is the latitude distance the sun travels north or south for a duration of one month. For each month, the latitude location of the sun is shown at day 1, day 10, day 20, and day 30 or 31. The sun travels north in gate four during month one, which has 30 days. The sun travels north in gate five during month two, which has 30 days. I love that you did this because I was, I was going to try to do something similar in video format with the gates and a visual the sun travels north in gate six during month three which has 31 days and the summer solstice this was a lot of powerpoint slides just run together <laughs> the sun travels south in gate six during month four which has 30 days the sun travels south in gate five during month five which has 30 days The sun travels south in gate four during month six, which has 31 days in the fall equinox. The sun travels south in gate three during month seven, which has 30 days. The sun travels south in gate two during month eight, which has 30 days. The sun travels south in gate one during month nine, which has 31 days, and the winter solstice. The sun travels north in gate one during month 10, which has 30 days. The sun travels north in gate two during month 11, which has 30 days. The sun travels north in gate three during month 12, which has 31 days, and the spring equinox. Here is a quick recap of the gates throughout the 364-day year. All right, cool. Um, do you, what are we doing time? I think we're, we're doing there. pretty, we're, yeah, we're doing pretty good. Um, a lot of people in the chat are saying brother Sean's debate is coming up soon. Okay. So, right. I mean, let I'll, me know. I'll, I'll be catch it later, but yeah, it's, uh, I think we're doing well. We're uh, slide 88 here, brother. So I think okay. we're, we're coming close. All so. right. No, we're doing so, fine. Go for it. All right. So we can talk about the lunar cycle relationship between the sun and the moon. You know, a lunar cycle occurs on average, once every 29.5 days, which is the time it takes the sun to lap the moon. Uh, new moons start a lunar cycle. Sun and moon are closer together. Moon has no light. First quarter moon, the sun is 90 degrees west of the moon. Moon is 50% lit. 
was a lit side facing the sun. Full moon, sun is 100 degrees from the moon. Farthest away, moon is 100% lit. Third quarter moon, sun is 90 degrees east of the moon. Moon is 50% lit with a lit side facing the sun. New moon, day 29.5 of the lunar cycle, sun has lapped the moon. Lunar cycle is complete. There are, two, uh, there are 12 lunar cycles in a year. Six lunar cycles with a duration of 29 days, which equals 174 days. Six lunar cycles with a duration of 30 days, which is 180. So when you add those up, uh, 12 lunar cycles in a year for the moon is 354 days. So you go to the next slide. Okay, this is a, this is a good one too. So this actually, this video is going to capture what I did for the 31 uh, videos I did. It'll show the moon going through its phases each day uh, cool. from September 29th to October 28th. Nice. Okay. So I'm trying to show it's going to go pretty fast. Um, and if you want to watch it later on, it's better to look at on the uh, 31 videos. But each time I'm showing how, oh yeah, that, that moved really fast. But the illumination is going down, which means the sun is approaching, is getting closer to the moon. You can see the illumination. But you can look, you can see there the pictures, pieces of the light are breaking away from the moon. If it was a mass, it wouldn't do that. See that right there? At 83%. You, you want me to pause it on that? Yeah, I guess we could if you think. Yeah. So October 4th, 74 sun illumination. And that means the sun gets is getting slowly but closer to it. Um, and you can see, look at that surface of the moon. You have little specks that are like still lit up, but they're not connected to anything. So this is pretty much telling you that some kind of plasma. I mean, uh, there's no way that a reflection could do that. This is showing that there's light occurring from the moon. That plasma is like it's it, between the light that's separated from it. There's obviously invisible there. And that's part of how the moon loses its light each time. We'll see that occurring more and more. Hmm. So go ahead again. That, pass that one. That one's hard to see. I was, Now we're at 54%. Oh, there you go. Stop that one. So again, if you if you can see on the the right edge there, you still got you know you can see that there's a lot of holes there going on, and it almost when you look at it like that, almost looks like some kind of bubble thing. <laughs> it's hard to explain, but yeah. it 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 definitely isn't a mass because it's wherever it loses its light, there's nothing there except darkness. You know? Yeah. Almost looks like uh, acne on it or something. Yeah. Let it go for a little bit. That's the one. Stop that one. So look at that. I mean, that's crazy. At 44%. I mean, look at there's like huge holes. Um, so I don't think, you know, especially now that we know this where the sun and moon are doing with themselves. I mean, the sun is only 45 miles above the moon when it's going around. Um, this is something this is an electromagnetic relationship that's going on here, mm -hmm. you know. And that one's pretty interesting too. It just sh slows, you know, shows each day how it's losing its light. Yeah. As closer the sun gets, I just let it keep going. But, yep. So when it gets to October 14th, let's kind of slow that one down a little bit once we get there. Okay. A couple of days I had couldn't see the sun, so I had to, I still could get the data on the navigational data. Stop that one. So this is a uh, go back one. If you, I don't know if you can go back a little bit. So I didn't expect this. I, I knew that there was a new moon on October 14th. I knew that there was an annual eclipse going somewhere else on in the United States. But I set my camera up, you know, and I put a filter on it because I knew I was just going to take a picture of the sun thinking I'm not going to see the moon because <laughs> there's there's no light right now on the moon. It's It's invisible. But then my first picture at 1208 was like, oh my gosh, there's a black orb there blocking the sun. And actually that's a picture, I had some pictures earlier where the, the disc was actually higher up to the right, you know? Okay, yeah. So obviously, you know, in that video, that 
the 14th of October, that one I used the little clip on Star Wars saying that's no moon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, then the next the next picture on there, which is go a little farther forward. Stop it right there. So based on the data, um, this is what's happening. This is the actual location of the moon, 45 miles below the sun, but it's visible, invisible. So like the person said, you know, the moon's always got to be below the sun to show a quote eclipse. But um, when they had the full annual annular uh, eclipse where the locations were, when you look at the data, yes, they are perfectly lined up, and that's how they get away with the, the lie. At those locations, the uh, altitude and azimuth angles are exactly the same for the moon and the sun, which mm. puts the moon right in front of the sun, right? The problem is, what about, that could only happen in that point. What about somebody looking at it from another angle or, or on the south? Why couldn't they see it? Well, because it's invisible. The, moon, the moon's invisible. Right. So I'm just saying that the only time they can do this is when it's perfectly lined up so they can act like the moon's blocking the sun because it's got the same altitude and angle. Then they whatever this is an orb, we don't we know some of us think it could be mm. uh, is Azazel's home, you know, in the sky. Yeah. Um, so are we are we surmi surmising here that um, this uh, this home base for Azazel potentially is in between the sun and the moon? Like, you know, how the, what was it, a 45-mile differentiation between where the sun's elevation and the moon's elevation? Is that what it was, 45? It's 45 miles, miles right. Yeah. Right. So so this layer, we're call, we'll call it Satan's layer, It's it would right. be above the moon's elevation. Yeah, it has but, to be to do this, right. Yeah, and it's and it's would it be the same size, too, as, as the two, as the sun and the moon, in terms right. of, like, how big it is? I think as Azel Smart, he knows how to deceive. So uh, I actually sent West Blaze a text message on this, and I said because uh, they were talking about an uncommon ground, you know, the orb. Yeah. And I said, well, based on the data that I have and knowing how far, um, you know, the sun is 3,107 miles away. The problem is we don't know how far the how high in elevation the uh, firmament is, you know. Mm -hmm. I, and I said, if I assume 100 miles, I'm thinking it's not that high up. I almost feel like the firmament's almost like a contact lens to the earth. It's fairly low. I, I don't know for sure because we're not allowed to know. But any 60 miles to 100 miles, you're, you're getting close to a full vacuum up there, right? I mean, because there's no pressure. So, and that's probably another why they can, reason they can do stuff with their technology to stay up there. So I said, okay, well, if the orb, if that orb is 100 miles, then I did the same distance to uh, uh, diameter ratio. Well, I know it needs to be a certain size to cover it up. So if it's 100 miles, it doesn't have to be near as big as the sun or moon because it's you know, it's closer to our perspective. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I calculated it to be a, a mile in diameter would do the dis would do the same thing. It would practically be the same perspective as far as the size. At 100 right. miles, it would be a mile one mile in diameter to to block it like it does for the full fake solar eclipse gotcha. yep. you know so now we're like independence day <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so this just keeps going through again a lot more detail could be seen in that whole playlist that i've done it's pretty educational go hit that like button guys when you watch these videos over on geotruth thanks and so now you were seeing the sun, basically it's, it's passed by the moon and it's um, going farther away and it's going to go to a full moon here in a little bit. But, uh, and then we see light come back on the surface of the disc. Mm -hmm. And you know what, a real simple thing, people could do this easily. The sun's always faster than the moon. And so in 29.5 days, when you divide that into 360 degrees, the sun moves 12.2 degrees faster than the moon each day. So you can easily just look, you know, say, oh, all right, we just had a new moon. Let's see how far the sun is from the moon the next day. And just, you can do that yourself each day. And you'll see the sun keep getting farther away. And probably the middle time of that 29.5 days, you can actually almost sometimes see the sun and the moon apart from each other in the sky, you know? Wow, yeah.
again, visual ob observation. So very neat, very neat. Pretty much done there now, but so super yeah. cool. Good yeah. job. I, I'm liking, I'm liking the um, the homework you've done, brother. Research right. the uh, you know you've you've done so, your due diligence. Yeah. So then I also looked at uh, the cycles that this, this is coming off of time and date.com is pretty much the, what the mainstream science and NASA says, right? So the lunar cycle for a moon for 2023 conforms to our observations for CNOC chapter 78 and 79 in NASA and mainstream science. Because what I did is I just made it basically a table here for, for how, how long it is days between, you know, the cycles of a lunar cycle and um this is full moon to full moon not new moon to new moon so when you look and you add these up you look at you know you've got six cycles that are 30 days and you got six days six cycles that are 29 and guess what when you total it up to 354 days so yeah. even here's another data point that we see and observe that enoch tells us that's what it is you know yeah and jubilees yeah group. yep yeah. And this basically talks about you know, the moon is 354 days, uh, Jubilee 6, 36, 38, for there will be those who will surely make observations of the moon, how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year, 10 days too soon. And here we go. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, first Enoch 79.5 and how it falls behind the sun, according to the law of the stars, by exactly five days in one period of time when it has completed the pathway you've seen. First Enoch chapter 78 states the duration of a monthly lunar cycle is 30 days and six months of the year and 29 days and six months of the year, averaging 29.5 days for 12 months. 78, 15, and for three months, at its proper time, it achieves 30 days. And for the three months, it achieves 29 days during the, which it completes its waning. 78, 16, and the time it's, of its rising for three months, it appears each month with 30 days. And for three months, it appears each month with 29 days. So NASA and mainstream science state about this lunar cycle. The moon displays phases after, this is what mainstream science and NASA says. Mm -hmm. The moon displays phases one after the other as it moves through its cycles each month. It takes about 27.3 days for the moon to orbit the Earth. However, because of how sunlight hits the moon, it takes 29.5 days to go from one new moon to the next. They actually tell you the truth, but they hide it with the orbit crap. I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't say that, but yeah. No, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. no, it's 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 frustrating. You yeah. know, the lengths that they go to, to to lie and to yeah. deceive. Yeah. yeah. So and uh first Enoch chapter 78 states the electromagnetic relationship between the sun and the moon. The moon's lunar cycle of new first quarter full and third quarter moon is described in first Enoch 78, 10 to 14. First Enoch 78, 10, and Uriel showed me another law. When light is transferred to the moon on which side it is transferred from the sun. So that's why we see, you know, the lit side of the moon is always facing the sun. First Enoch 7811, at, at the time that the moon is increasing its light, it transfers as it becomes opposite the sun until in 14 days, its light is full in the sky. And when it's all ablaze, its light is full in the sky. That's a full moon. Yeah. First Enoch 7812, and on the first day it is called the new moon, and on that day, day like, rises in it. That's First where Enoch, it's starting, right? That's where yeah. it starts to, yeah. Right. First Enoch 78, 13, and its light becomes full exactly on the day that as the sun goes down in the west, it rises from the east for the night, and the moon shines for the whole night until the sun rises opposite, and the moon is seen opposite the sun. Sometimes you can almost see them the same, same time, you know, mm -hmm. the moon and the sun uh, at the same time which means they're almost 180 degrees apart, full moon. Yeah. First Enoch 78, go ahead. Okay. Oops, sorry, 14. Good. First Enoch 78, 14, on the side on which the light of the moon appears, there again it wanes until its light disappears. And the days of the moon end and its disk remains empty without light. So where he's telling us there's nothing but light. When there's no light, it's empty, invisible. Yeah. Uh, this is a good, this is, some people get upset with this too. <laughs> Why solar eclipses with the sun and moon are impossible to occur. You know, NASA and mainstream science definition of a solar eclipse is a solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes between the sun 
Earth and the Sun, thereby obscuring the view of the Sun from a part, small part of the Earth, totally or partially. Such an alignment occurs approximately every six months during the eclipse season and its new moon phase. We scientifically proven the Sun and Moon are approximately 30 miles in diameter and circle the Earth clockwise at 3,107 miles and 3,062 miles, respectively, above the stationary Earth, which is 24,856 miles in diameter. The Earth's diameter is 829 times larger than the Sun or Moon's diameter. We silently particularly proven that the Moon is a light and not a mass. A full Moon occurs when the Moon is full of light or 100% illuminated. During a full Moon, the Sun is 180 degrees longitude away, or 12 hours away from the Moon. A new moon occurs when the moon has no light or 0% illumination. It is therefore invisible. During a new moon, the sun and moon are on the same longitude line and right next to each other. The moon is always 45 miles below the sun and during a new moon is invisible. So that's how it's a lie. Therefore, yeah. it is impossible for solar eclipses to occur with a moon during a new moon because the moon is invisible and can never block the sun or the sun's light. However, we do observe an unknown black orb phenomena blocking the sun during the solar eclipses, posing as the moon. Isn't it a coincidence that solar eclipses always occur during new moons when the moon is invisible, which would allow another phenomenon to, to pose as a moon? Yeah. What and a the coincidence. word eclipse is never mentioned in the Almighty God's scripture concerning the sun and moon. It's not part of his law. It's not, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Amen. And then this is one is more easy to explain really why lunar eclipses with the sun and moon are impossible to occur. Same thing about, here's their definition now about a lunar eclipse. It's an astronomical event that occurs when the moon moves into the earth's shadow, causing the moon to be darkened. Such alignment occurs during eclipse season approximately every six months. Interesting, it's every six months for both eclipses. During the full moon phase, this can only occur when the sun, earth, and moon are exactly or very closely aligned with Earth between the other two. In other words, Earth is between the sun and the moon. So, you know, we've gone through that other stuff before. It therefore is impossible for lunar eclipses to occur with the sun and moon during a full moon because the sun and moon are both above the Earth and 12 hours apart from each other. We've proven that. It is physically impossible for the Earth to be between the sun and the moon as required for a lunar eclipse. Both sun and moon are rotating around the Earth that's 820 times larger. Almighty God, Almighty God designed the light changing occurrence during a full moon as a sign or an ordinance to mankind. Mm, amen. Yeah. So I always end up with this. Always seek the truth. I love these verses. Uh, that's what we have to do is seek truth because uh, God is spirit and truth. Uh, Yahweh is that that's his character and that's who he is. And he wants us to live that way. John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Proverbs 12, 17, he who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness is deceit. Proverbs 12, 19, the truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment, which is good because we know as Azel's lying tongue is but for a moment. <laughs> it's coming yeah. to an end. Yeah. Proverbs 23, 23, buy truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and understanding and under instruction and understanding. Yeah. Amen. Great scriptures. Yeah. That concludes it, does it, brother? Yeah. I'm amazed. Well, <laughs> well we, we hit we hit the two hour mark. That's great. Yeah. I, yeah. I appreciate that. You've definitely given us a a tomahawk steak meat to chew on. It's good. I'm sure for many folks, it's um it's one of those presentations that you got to watch a couple of times, I think, right. to really to follow along with a lot of the uh, like the mathematical calculations right. and stuff. But right. it, this is why we have brilliant minds uh, in this community like yourself who, who can who can do this, who can break down these numbers and present it to us to kind of guide us through how to understand it and how it works right. and operates. So I really do appreciate you uh, coming on this evening and, and presenting. That was that was really Awesome. Thank and guys, you. please, please, if you did enjoy this and you're into um, this type of content, go over to Geo Truth YouTube. You, do you have a Facebook I as do well? Have, or is, well, I do yeah. have a Facebook. Yeah, it's, it's Geo Truth Facebook. Okay. Yeah. So a, any other socials or anything else you want, you'd like to plug there before we, I think we're going to, we'll probably mm -hmm. end this now. We'll, we might take questions maybe, maybe next time we we'll do a follow-up. Okay. 
um, okay. or a different type of presentation. But um, well, yeah, if they well. have questions, uh, if they text or they make comments in the presentation, I could respond to them after this, right? Yeah, that or leave comments um, on your videos on your channel that you can get to. Is there an email? Do you have like a GeoTruth Gmail or anything like that that people can go and yeah, ask you questions? Uh, it's geotruth07 at gmail.com. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, family, thank you so much for hanging out with us this evening. That, that was that was fun. Um, very comprehensive. Again, it's it's a, a joy to to go over this information. Um, it, it's always solidifies the faith that I have in my creator when I when I see how this stuff lines up, right? It's just it right. becomes more the picture becomes clearer for me. Yeah. And that's what we want in, in these uh obscure days, you know, yes. where where yeah. deception and lies is just so rampant. And that's the, the devil's mandate is to to make sure that no one is, you know, yeah. knowing what truth is at all, right? Exactly. So we need more people like you. We need more people speaking out for truth and, and being willing to present such stuff. And so again, I applaud you, brother. I, I appreciate Thank you. you doing Thank this. Thank you for having me on too. I just I love I love your channel. I follow you all the time and the scriptures that you get into are fantastic. And you know once the truth, you know, the truth, you want to keep knowing more truth. And it's like, and it really makes sense when Jesus says, you know, you know, don't conform to the world, you know, conform to him and his yeah. father, you know? And so it's like, we don't care about anything going on in the world anymore. It's amazing. We don't watch much TV. If we, whatever we do, it's going to be about the always word or we're into the word. We're looking for other books of scripture, like you and Sean really do awesome jobs of just pointing out this truth from other scriptures in uh, West Blaze too. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, there's guys, a, there's a bunch of great warriors yeah. for Yahweh's truth. Thank you. Yeah, of course, brother. I appreciate it. And we will have you on again. Um, we might touch on the calendar and speaking of the calendar yeah. guys, I've got this guy still, I still have a few copies left. Um, you know, the, the new year technically isn't, isn't, you know, it's a little while away still. So if you want to get a copy of this, reach out to me at, hanging on his words at gmail.com. I think I have about 15 or 20 calendars left. So reach out if you're interested. And also brother George, I'm taking it upon myself to do a peg calendar. I saw that. Cause I was yes. mentioning about trying to make, make one myself and you beat me to it. So that's awesome. <laughs> I saw that. Um, I definitely want to order one. So I'll, you know, next time I get, send you something in the mail, I'll take care of it. But no, yeah, that's great, man. Absolutely, brother. You, you don't have to send me anything in the mail. It's all good. But yeah, if you guys are interested in this too, again, reach out, hang on his words at gmail.com. If, uh, if you want one of these guys, it's going to take a little bit of time to make it. I'm starting production, if I want to call it that. In February, my wife and I um, were able to secure a different house, which is oh. going to accommodate for me to make some dust and, and you know chop some wood and stuff like that and paint whereas right now where i'm at i can't really do that we're in a okay. smaller apartment so early february is when i'll get to the doing these for those who have already ordered and um, for those who want to yeah that's it's a neat little yeah. calendar it goes along with everything we talked about tonight um it's yeah. part of yahweh's creation calendar and uh yeah. yeah it's just a joy to be able to offer this for you folks yeah. so if you're interested reach out but yeah, our, our brother Sean, he's he's a master debater and he's debating, I guess, right now. I guess he's been at oh. it maybe for a little bit. So he's talking right. on the Trinity again. He's that's his his shtick, his his, uh, yeah. his forte. So um a lot of people probably are over there starting to watch that now, and I'm excited to to get to that debate as well. Yeah, so me too. Thank you so much, brother. Geo Truth you. YouTube channel, guys. Hit, hit him up there. You know, show some love, subscribe, watch his videos, hit the like buttons on this one as well. If you enjoyed it tonight, hit the, the thumbs up, please. And if you haven't subscribed and you're interested in the content on this channel, please do that. It uh, would be greatly appreciated. So again, brother, much love. Thanks. Love you. Love you too. Um, blessings to you and uh, Maranatha. Yeah. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, guys. Much love to you and enjoy your Sabbath. Just bask in it. It's it's amazing. Our father created it for us to to just chill out, reset, recalibrate whatever we need to do. You know, he he created it for for many reasons, but that's what I'm going to be doing. And so I appreciate you guys joining me this evening, and I I do love you. I, I appreciate everybody who supports this channel and sends encouraging messages and um and has you know of late. You know, a lot of you guys um. I've reached out to me with uh, when I shared some news um, 
that was a little tragic in our, our family. And I do appreciate the, uh, the comfort and encouragement that you guys have uh, offered me. So it's a great, great community we have here. Pray for each other, lift each other up in prayer, show love and walk as the Messiah walked. And uh, one day we will walk in those beautiful, on those beautiful uh, streets of gold, right? That's, that's the goal. And so if I don't ever get to see you guys in this flesh, I look forward to giving you those high fives in the kingdom. Um, it'll be a good day. So keep your eyes on the prize and much love to you guys.